heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest updates from the Middle East. That's after Iran launched missiles and drones over the weekend into Israel. The US and Europe, they ramp up calls for Israeli restraint. Full coverage ahead. Plus, shares of Tesla slump amid the company's plans to slash 10% of its global workforce, prompting senior executives to depart the company. We have the details. And Apple, it faces its worst iPhone slump since COVID, as the company faces increased competition in China. We'll discuss that and so much more throughout this hour. But first, we turn our attention to a complex geopolitical and macroeconomic picture that's being painted today. Now, the pull ahead really is the fact that Nasdaq is currently back in the red. We were managing to push higher on stocks, but certainly the bond market feel the full effect of actually a stronger, more resilient macroeconomic picture in the United States coming from retail sales that were far faster than had been anticipated. But on the flip side is geopolitics. Is a concern about, of course, an unprecedented attack coming from Iran to Israel and what that really means in terms of actually a dialing up or cooling of some of those geopolitical anxieties. Notably, oil is on the lower side. That drags the Bloomberg Commodity Index down. But remember, there's actually added sanctions on Russian movement of metals into the LME at the moment, and that's been moving around aluminium and some other key metals to be keeping an eye on. So complex going on in the commodity space as well. But let's move it on as we try to really anticipate which way risk assets are going to be going. One that was in full effect, because ultimately it was the only risk asset that was really able to be traded at the time of those initial reports, as many had anticipated an attack coming from Iran into Israel. But we see the volatility that was in display when it came to Bitcoin on Saturday afternoon. Plummeting, we now recover some of that. We're still off by more than 4% over the course of a three-day trading period, Ed. We're currently at 63,900 or thereabouts. But what are you watching on the micro? Tesla. It's a big one. I broke the story this morning that Drew Baglino, who led powertrain and energy at Tesla, one of only four named executive officers has resigned and left the company. The stock near session lows down 3.3%. We also confirmed Elon Musk has told staff that 10% of the workforce will be cut in pursuit of cost reduction, productivity, and what he called duplicate roles. We'll get all the details later from the Bloomberg team. The other big one is Apple. IDC data showed shipments of about 50 million iPhones in the first quarter, but that's down 10% year on year. Now that's third party data, and it's not just an Apple story with the stock down eight tenths of 1%. It's a story about China's domestic smartphone makers having success, growing market share in a really key market. We We'll speak to Bloomberg's Mark Gurman because it's complicated, but Apple is lower. Whether that's causal or not, who knows? Uh, a lot going on in the world of technology this morning, but also a lot of news around the world. Yeah, and let's get back to it, Ed, because Iran's attack on Israel is what many are talking of. Israel and its allies intercepted the overwhelming majority of more than 300 missiles, drones fired by Iran. Joining us now from Tel Aviv is our Israel Bureau Chief and Senior Editor, Ethan Brona, and we thank you for your time, Ethan. More broadly, how is it being felt and digested in Israel right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that the uh, the overall sense is of relief because, as you said, of 350 projectiles, including 120 ballistic missiles that come here in eight or ten minutes from Iran, uh, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, were stopped before they got here. There were about half a dozen that got through to um, uh, a military base in Israel. Uh, they didn't do much damage, but they did hit. And so there was a kind of a mixed feeling of, well, we got them. Uh, we don't, nobody was killed, but there was a seven-year-old girl fighting for her life shrapnel that hit her in the south. But the general sense is this could have been much, much worse. So we can, we, Israel, can take its time to decide what to do next. But there is a, a Rubicon that's been crossed. I mean, we, we have for the very first time in nearly four decades has Israel taken a direct hits from missiles of this kind and the first time ever in this, what has been a shadow war between Israel and Iran emerged from the shadows. So we're in a new era and it's not clear where, what that means. 
Uh, Ethan, later in the program, we're going to talk a little bit about the sort of coalition response. You know, Israel uh, it made those interceptions in, in conjunction with the United States and the United Kingdom. True. I, I, I'd also like to learn a little bit about the kind of operational response on the ground in Israel, what it is happening in the streets, what the government is telling its citizens of where we stand. So at the moment, um, in fact, the, there is a sense of calm. The government issued a statement that they were going to reopen the schools and the, the sort of day camps that they had closed on Saturday night in anticipation of this attack. Uh, so there is, uh, everything is back to normal, I think it's fair to say. Um, and the, the, by the way, the, the Iranians also reopened their airspace. So there is no sense that there's going to be a continuation of this war in the coming three days. On the on the other hand, the uh, Israeli cabinet met last night and met again tonight in order to discuss what kind of response uh, it needs to have. And uh, those on the far right are urging a very vigorous response, a crushing attack, as they put it. Uh, that it's not clear if they're going to have their way. It doesn't seem so because it does feel that the embrace that the United States, the United Kingdom, and France of Israel at this point has been a, a warm bath for Israelis after many weeks of hostility hostility because of their war in Gaza. Uh, at the same time, you see, the Israelis have two audiences they worry about, these that we just talked about, and then their enemies, that is Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran, and they fear that any lack of reaction will be perceived as weakness, and so there is a sense that they must react. The question is when and how. Uh, Bloomberg's Ethan Bronner on the ground in Tel Aviv. Really grateful for your time uh, on the ground Pleasure. reporting as well. And we have a big audience in this show in Europe and the EMEA region more broadly. I'd point out that EasyJet, one of the airlines as an example, has cancelled flights to Israel through April 21st. So there's a kind of business impact there as well. Let's go from Israel to Washington, D.C. and bring in Bloomberg national security reporter Nick Wadhams. Nick, I was talking to Ethan about the kind of coalition response that you, the United States was involved. The United Kingdom was involved, in part because Iran had given a heads up almost on their actions. Uh, my understanding is Biden has been in, in touch with the Israeli government quite frequently. What do we know from the U.S. side at this stage? Well, what we're hearing from the administration is essentially that they want uh, Israel to put the brakes on any sort of response. So uh, we've been told uh, the view from the White House is, listen, Israel, take the win. Uh, your air defenses did an extraordinary job uh, deflecting and rebuffing about 99 percent of those incoming drones and missiles. And there is no need for an immediate response. Obviously, as Ethan just said, the pressure on uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu who is coming uh, very much from the other direction as well. So looking ahead for the next few days, what we're really going to see here is uh, a, a good reflection on the limits of U.S. leverage over Prime Minister Netanyahu. Pr President Biden could not have been more clear about what he wants to see next, which is de-escalation. The U.S. does not want to be pulled in deeper into this conflict. They don't want this to turn into a, a even a bigger conflagration, and they want Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to hold fire. Whether we, he uh, listens to that advice is another thing entirely. For now, rightly or wrongly, the market, and that is often what we focus in on here at Bloomberg, has been deeming this to be something that's containable as of the moment, Nick. Where do we have to align our sights now? Is it thinking of the next statement that we do get from Biden? We anticipate a conversation, a, a press conference as soon as 12 o'clock. That's right. So, I mean, the, the, we'll really be looking at what the tone is from the president and from other other uh, officials in the administration. You know, are, are they projecting unity? Is there more sense of those fractures that had emerged in recent weeks with Israel? Do we have a sense that these two governments are diverging in uh, their perspectives on what the outcome will be here? I mean, it, it, the, the attack by Iran could have been so much worse. I think you're seeing in the market, uh, in some ways, a sense of relief that Israel repelled those. As Ethan mentioned, there had been no deaths and fairly limited destruction. Uh, but what happens if Iran uh, decides to respond yet again if in response to a potential Israeli retaliation? So there's a lot of fear that there could be an escalatory spiral that gets to a situation that neither side can control. Nick Wadhams, thank you for giving us the context and keeping us up to speed.
let's talk about Tesla. The EV maker is going to cut 10% of its workforce after a slowdown in, in demand, with Elon Musk preparing the company for the next phase of growth. We also reported this morning that two key executives have left Tesla in the last 24 hours. Drew Baglino, who's been at Tesla for 18 years and led everything to do with powertrain, energy storage, resigned is what I'm told by a source, and he confirmed that later on in a post. Rowan Patel is basically the public policy chief, uh, in many ways the kind of de facto voice piece of Tesla on social media. He has also left the company. Let's bring in Bloomberg's global auto czar, Craig Trudell. Uh, Craig, it was a, a bit of a, a long night or an early morning, depending on where you were around the world. But let's start with Drew Baglino. Um, one of only four named executive officers at Tesla. I thought this was a surprise, and what sources told me is that he resigned. He wasn't laid off as part of the 10% cut. What else do, do you know? Yeah, I, I know uh, less than you, you know, Ed, but I do have to sort of speculate about you know, the, the extent to which this may be about, you know, a difference of opinion on the direction of the company. This, you know, this, these, this news comes shortly after uh, reports that the, the company is, uh, you know, maybe putting aside its work on a, a cheaper vehicle and focusing efforts on a robo-taxi. I think Elon Musk, uh, you know, at first uh, called that a report by Reuters false and then, you know, seemed to sort of lend credence to it by scheduling an introduction of a, a robo-taxi months from now, uh, which, you know, sort of suggests that, uh, you know, he, he's focused on that. And, mm -hmm. you know, that raises questions about whether, uh, wh whether Baglino thought that's the right move, whether Rohan Patel uh, uh, thinks that's the right move. After all, uh, he's going to be the person in, or would have been the person in Washington who would have to sort of justify that to, to regulators and whether or not uh, Tesla is really ready to uh, to put that forward is, is a question after years and years of the company uh, talking about having robo-taxis or at least Musk talking about having robo-taxis yes. when they haven't. All of this is sort of trying to be a level of prioritization or anxiety that is among investors at the moment. Many would say, okay, cutting down on expenses on costs is something that is necessary in the context of EV sales more broadly, Craig. What could be therefore be really unnerving the investor base right now when you have SVPs leaving? Is it more the concern about the handing over of power ultimately, any sort of fact that Musk currently leads and has done since 2008? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's this concern about, you know, not knowing what the plan is, right? And, and this is not, uh, you know, just a, a story that has only surfaced lately. Uh, you know, we go back to the Walter Isaacson biography uh, months ago, and one of the more compelling bits within that book was this idea that there was real difference at the top of, of Tesla as to whether or not, uh, you know, they should design this next generation vehicle with or without a steering wheel. And you had within that book, you know, this really uh, compelling section of, of, you know, executives having to kind of talk Musk out of this idea that they could just, you know, design the car without a steering wheel and count on the idea that the technology was ready. And I think that's something that, you know, we've seen for, for some time, this idea that, you know, Musk has, has really sort of been out on a limb in terms of how quickly this company will be able to put self-driving cars on the road and what other executives have said, including you know, engineers that have had to testify in lawsuits related to people losing their lives because they put too much trust into Tesla's driver assistance system. So right. this is something that's really uh, tricky if, if you're an executive who has to kind of you know, square that circle. Yeah, uh, Craig, quickly, I think let's just re recap the basics. 10% of the workforce to be cut. How many people is that and where is it? Yeah, so this is a company that ended last year with over 140,000 people. So assuming uh, this is company-wide, we know it's uh, global, according to Musk's email to staff, uh, that would be more than 14,000 people. Uh, we're careful on that because Musk has been a little bit uh, all over the place with his messaging in the past when he's made job cuts. Craig Trudell, we thank you so much. It's just been a phenomenal amount of reporting coming from both of you gentlemen. And so thank you very much for setting the context. Meanwhile, coming up, Apple iPhone shipments falling 10% in the March quarter, making it the worst sales slump since COVID. 
We're going to bring you the details next, another key points drag on these benchmarks. Ed, what are you watching on the micro level too? A little bit of M&A Monday. Bloomberg reported that Salesforce is, uh, according to sources, looking at a deal for Informatica. It's all about data capabilities. The stock down more than 5% on it. The street kind of likes it, but it's a deal we're waiting on confirmation on. Uh, Bloomberg said it could be reached this month. So let's stay tuned for that as we go. This is Bloomberg Technology. Apple. It's facing its worst iPhone slump since COVID, as competition in the Chinese market really does heat up. Now, third quarter shipments are apparently sliding worse than expected, almost 10% as the tech giant delivered 50.1 million phones, falling shy of analyst estimates of 51.7 million. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman joins us now with the context of who's providing us this data and what it means about Apple versus the other competitors. Yeah, so IDC puts out their quarterly reports on smartphone shipments. And of course, these are their analysis-based uh, insights into how many units were shipped. So they don't know for sure. We'll get a better idea on May 2nd when Apple announces uh, its earnings report. And then we'll get a better idea from the other phone makers when they announce their earnings reports. But IDC is, is usually uh, on target in, in terms of a general range or in terms of uh, the overall theme. And the overall theme this time around is a nearly 10% uh, shipment decline on an annual basis for Apple. Uh, it's a, the most significant decline of any of the phone makers they track. Uh, it indicates that Samsung is back in the, in the number one global smartphone sales position. And it indicates that sales from some Chinese brands, one called Transition in particular, uh, with an over 80% year-over-year sales increase, uh, are really taking steam from Apple at this point. Uh, so if I were an Apple shareholder, it would be a little bit concerning uh, to see the, the slump going on right now for the company. And it seems like most of it is China-based. So we'll have to wait until May 2 to know for sure, however. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, Chief Correspondent covering Apple. Thank you. Let's keep the conversation going and bring in Fiona Sincotta now, who's Senior Market Analyst at City Index, for her take on Apple. And, and Mark summed up the IDC data very well. You either put emphasis on the Apple-specific data or you put emphasis on the market share data coming from the Chinese handset makers and how they had gains in sales. Where does your mind go to first, Fiona? Yeah, do you know what? I think it's a, you know, a really good idea to actually look at these two bits of data together. Because if you've got Apple falling and yet global smartphone uh, shipments elsewhere increasing, I think that makes it an even more dramatically difficult position um, and picture for Apple. I mean, it really does highlight, I think, the extent of the problems that, the, um, that Apple is facing, particularly surrounding the iPhone. And I think, I mean, obviously China here is a very big story. There is a lot of competition um, that Apple is facing in China. But I think there's also another side to this as well. I just feel that Apple is really behind just as far as innovation is concerned, as far as AI is concerned. And all that's also playing out in the share price, which has really had a tough start to 2024. $2.7 trillion market cap still. But as along with Tesla are two key stories today. These two names in the so-called Magnificent Seven have been anything but magnificent, it feels like, in the last month or so, certainly beginning of this year, Fiona. Can Apple win back yours and other investors' hearts and minds if they are going to be able to show, look, we've got AI within the M4 processor, we're going to be able to have it, you know, sometimes they're known to be a little bit slower, but getting it right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, definitely um, a little bit slower. They feel like they're very slow to the AI party right now. Uh, and, and, and that's been sort of, you know, punished by, they've been punished by investors. And that, I think, you know, has been part of that um, sell-off that we've seen. And I think there is a potential for this to turn around. I don't think this is the end of the line at all for Apple. I think, you know, we could see a good turnaround as long as they get that AI products really spot on. I think also sort of, you know, the, the geographical diversification into India is an area that, again, could be very interesting 
interesting for Apple as it moves away from China. But at the end of the day, China is a massive in market and it's also a very important market. So it's going to be very interesting to see whether Apple can actually turn this around quickly without any support from really from China. You know, Fiona, last night, Caroline and I regrouped with the team and we we're like, you know, what's the story going to be Monday? It, it looked like Apple, we had the geopolitics of what's happening in the Middle East and then Tesla. And I'm trying to find a commonality between all of them. I think that the commonality is, should we be talking more about the health of the global economy right now, particularly for consumer facing technology? Yes, exactly. So that's a really, really important point here as well. I think the macro backdrop for these stocks is just not ideal right now. You know, if we have a look at where we are um, speaking as far as macro picture is concerned, it's not smooth sailing at all for the consumer. You know, we've got the prospect of the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates high for longer after we've seen those hotter than expected inflation figures last week. But then saying that, we've also seen that the retail sales in the US are holding up. But I think, you know, when you've got financing costs so high um, in the US, that does obviously impact those that are purchasing cars, their ability to be able to get financing or even desire to get financing. But also when you've got squeeze on households, you know, big, big expensive items such as the latest iPhones are going to be perhaps items which aren't necessarily top of the list. So, you know, I do think the macro backdrop has a lot to play here as well. Fiona, if a client calls right now, do you say take risk off the table or do you say stay in equities even though they're near records? Question. Oh, it's a good question. You know, I think there is the potential for things to go higher if we start to see that um, inflation starts to cool again, if we start to see uh, geopolitical tensions start to calm again, then I think there is a potential there. But, you know, we've got earning season. We're just mm -hmm. ramping up earning season now. And I think that's going to be a good distraction um, for the market to be able to sort of have a look what's actually going on to see whether the lofty valuations are actually supported by the fundamentals. Goldman Sachs, for example, managing to beat and talking up AI. City Index Senior Market Analyst Fiona Sincotta. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology, Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde right here in New York. Let's get you a quick check on these markets because there is a complicated context to what's going on in the markets right now, whether it's a macro picture that shows resiliency in a U.S. economy, those retail sales still showing real strength of a U.S. consumer, and then the geopolitical situation we currently find ourselves trying to understand, get a grip as to where we push forward with Israel and Iran, an unprecedented attack coming from Iran on Israel over the course of the weekend. Nasdaq pushing back into the green. We had been in the red a little bit on the Nasdaq benchmark more broadly as some of the anxiety was still there to be seen within the markets. But Apple actually and indeed Tesla, key points drags on the Nasdaq 100 more broadly. Apple off by six tenths percent. We're worried about market share, particularly as competition builds up over in China. And the IDC numbers show that Apple has had its worth quarter in terms of sales since back in the COVID days. Tesla off by 2.8%. This is down to your reporting, Ed, more broadly on the fact that executives are leaving and indeed 10% of the workforce looking to be removed as they really try and focus on a market that has been under pressure of late. That's off by 2.8%. But we want to move on to what happened when it comes to risk assets over the course of the weekend. This is a geopolitical story that we need to shine a light on in terms of Bitcoin sold off hard on Saturday afternoon. Why? It's one of the only risk assets that you were able to trade when you first learned that indeed Iran has lived up to its, to what it had been telling certain members of, of leaders across the world that they would indeed be looking to attack Israel. And we saw it hit some $61,000 at one point. We're off by 3.6% over the last three trading days. And I think that's where we try to dissect. There is ongoing volatility in an asset like crypto and Bitcoin. But then where are the applications in the here and the now? Fabian Astix here to sort of drill down on what he's seeing as managing director and global head of digital economy over at Moody's Ratings. You're someone who's been thinking about the halving, the so-called fundamentals of Bitcoin, the way in which we can adopt blockchain technology. But when you look at the volatility as it is still not a store of value, but ultimately a risk asset, how does that make your conversations harder? Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually very hard to guess uh, the direction of travel for Bitcoin right, overall, because when you think about it, it's, um, the value of it is not driven by clear economic drivers, unlike other assets. So 
trying to predict the value of Bitcoin is like trying to predict people's thought. So it can be a lot of things. It could be the macro environment, it could be uh, the geopolitical environment, that could be many other things. And it could be the halving that's coming up uh, probably at the end of this week. Uh, which uh, affects behaviors, in particular people right now betting up or down, and it creates more volatility, which is to be expected. And it has nothing to do with kind of the long-term evolution of the price, but at least as of now, you're seeing volatility. Yeah, many would say, look, if it's meant to be a store of value, if it's meant to be in some way a fight against inflation, you would have thought in a a risk-averse, worrying time of geopolitics, you would be in Bitcoin rather than selling off, but then people say, look, this is a risk asset that you could say show your anxiety in over the course of the weekend. So when you say that you shouldn't be predicting it on a day-to-day -day basis, how then do you ensure that people are thinking about digitization, about real-world assets becoming tokenized, when people are still fundamentally trying to work out whether they should even be having 1% or 2% of their wealth in cryptocurrency? All right, so that's a great question, and those are very different things, I would say. Uh, Cryptocurrencies, per se, are essentially very speculative. Uh, people are betting up, down, as I said, uh, with probably some upward pressure post having, at least if you believe that uh, the past is a good proxy for the future. Um, but traditionally, I would say, uh, it started with crypto, it started with Bitcoin, then Ether and others. Uh, and then what we observed was that financial institutions and institutional investors in general were very cautious traditionally about cryptocurrencies per se. So you started to see like a different segment of the digital finance ecosystem that was more about using the technology underlying Bitcoin and other assets and reusing the technology to repipe financial markets and the global eco economy to make it potentially better, faster, more efficient. So crypto was mainly for retail investors and the rest of digital finance mainly for uh, institutional investors. And that's really uh, what we've been keeping an eye on and what will probably reshape uh, financial markets going forward. Now, um, what's interesting is recently you saw a convergence in the sense that institutional investors, again, that were cautious, I would say instinctively, it was not even about regulation, even though it played a part of it, um, they suddenly decided that it was time to get into the crypto sphere as well, in particular with the approval of ET, uh, Bitcoin ETFs recently. And so now you're seeing institutional investors in both that kind of tokenization space, uh, which has many benefits, and also in the cryptocurrency space where uh, they were kind of uh, uh, not involved for a, a long time. Uh, Fabian, I'm fascinated by the credit rating perspective on this. You talk about the halving and then you think about the limit on supply long term, infinitely, of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But in moments like the weekend, in geopolitical crisis or, or risk off sentiment, there's just clear evidence it's a liquid market. So if you are approaching this from a credit rating perspective, what is the conclusion you draw? All right, so let me clarify one point here. Um, a cryptocurrency in and of itself, and Bitcoin in particular, uh, there's no credit risk associated with it. There's no promise associated with uh, with a cryptocurrency. So you can't really rate whether the issuer of a cryptocurrency will uh, meet its promise. And if it doesn't, by how much you're going to miss it, which is what credit ratings are intended to do. So the, there's, no cre there's no credit risk per se with the cryptocurrency. The reason we're keeping an eye on them, uh, and on Bitcoin in particular, is because you know that institutions out there, governments, corporations, and others, are invested in cryptocurrencies. So we want to keep track of whether it could impact their credit risk because they have that asset in their portfolio, for instance. And we also want to keep track of things like market, um, uh, contagion risk that could affect one way or the other from the crypto world into traditional finance or even the other around from traditional finance yes. into crypto uh, currency. So it is an asset class that is, um, you know, uh, that, that's been very resilient. It has no credit uh, risk per se, but indirectly others could see their credit risk profile affected by uh, the movements in the Bitcoin market. But there is a connection for secondary markets and the underlying technology, which is blockchain. That's something you look at very quickly. Explain your work there. 
Correct. So um, the financial markets are uh, likely being reshaped by technologies that look like Bitcoin, uh, that look like that looks uh, technologies that look like uh, blockchain. Sorry, um, and the reason is that those technologies make processes a lot more efficient. So I'm going to give you an example to illustrate uh, asset tokenization. Caroline mentioned that a minute ago. Uh, it's really the process of turning real-world assets into a digital uh, stamp on a blockchain platform. And because it's become a digital stamp, it's very easy to manage, to track, to trade. Uh, and those assets that are being tokenized could be anything from a bond or stock or real estate or art. And so you transfer all the legal rights, in particular the ownership rights that come with the assets. You push that into that digital token that you can trade and manage efficiently. So it makes it a lot more efficient to manage and trade. Uh, in particular, you can settle super quickly. It could be even just a, uh, immediate or a fraction of a second to settle payments on that blockchain. Uh, you can track and control everything that's happening. So it makes it better from a uh, risk and compliance perspective. Uh, and also, yes. it really creates uh, extra liquidity uh, and new uh, uh, opportunities to find funding and to invest overall. So think about a building, for instance. It's, it can be very hard to buy that building alone. But if you can tokenize and cut these tokens into small chunks that many people can invest in, suddenly right. that makes that asset easier to access. Uh, Fabian Astic, Deep Analysis, Managing Director and Global Head of Digital Economy at Moodings Ratings. We're grateful for your time. Coming up on the show, we're going to be joined by Google Cloud's Lee Moore on the company's new training initiative in generative AI, cybersecurity, and data analytic analytics. That's coming right up. Stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, a quick talking tech. There's a lot going on in the news. First up, the Biden administration plans to award Samsung as much as $6.4 billion in grants to increase chip production in Texas. This is part of U.S. efforts to bolster domestic semiconductor manufacturing. The South Korean company plans to invest more than $40 billion overall. Plus, Andreessen Horowitz closed $7.2 billion for its newest set of funds on Friday, according to an Axios report. The firm beat its own fundraising goal of $6.9 $6.9 billion with that capital aimed for its growth fund. And OpenAI named the former president of AWS's Japan arm, Tadao Nagasaki, to spearhead its push to woo enterprise clients in the world's fourth largest economy. OpenAI is opening an office in Tokyo as it releases a custom GPT-4 model catering to Japanese language users. Caroline. And let's get to more broadly an AI context right now, because we're all thinking about how to reskill, and companies are thinking about how to reskill their own employees at the moment. It's also been the focus of, well, Google Cloud. It's been thinking about its own role within this. Today, the company is announcing a new tech training initiative. It's in partnership with institutions like the US Department of the Treasury, like Rackspace as well, to prepare the workforce with generative AI skills and much more. I'm pleased to welcome Lee Moore, Global Google Cloud Consulting Vice President, Lee, I'm really interested in this because you're working with the public sector. Think of the Treasury Department and thinking of educational foundations and institutions as well as private companies. You're offering this all for free. Are you going to be charging? Where, where is the reward for you? Well, for us, we see uh, that we're really in this enterprise AI era and we have you know, the most amazing cloud technologies, but it's beyond the technology. It's also about the people. Uh, and in my organization, we're responsible for skilling up the workforce and skilling up our customers. And, and we see this huge demand for, for skills and, and jobs. And if you look at you know, the, the job data out there, you can see there's you know, many hundreds of thousands, 700,000 open roles for cloud analysts, 500,000 roles open for cybersecurity, and the world economy forum is quoting a million roles in in ai coming up so it's a huge huge opportunity for individuals and we believe you know launching these uh, programs we are today both the training and the on-ramps to, to to further education and the on-ramps to employment uh, is our role in the middle of that ecosystem uh, lee just just mechanically how does this work in in simple terms if you're working with the treasury department 
Yeah, so individuals can go over to Google Cloud Skills Boost. They, they can register and take these training programs in data analytics, in cybersecurity, and in generative AI. When they pass those qualifications, they're able to then uh, jump start the first step in the recruiting process for the partners we've signed up with so far. So. U.S. Department of Treasury, Jack, Jack Henry, and, and Rackspace, you know, they enable them to get through that first round of interviews uh, in, a, in a kind of consolidated way and move on through their process beyond that. Lee, what's really interesting, some of the statistics, the data showing that the C-suite has a lot of anxiety about this. They're worried about the lack of talent that they can get their hands on and the, and the roles you just articulated that still need to be filled. How much, dare I ask, does the C-suite have the AI skills necessary at the moment, do you think? Yeah, very interesting question. We also run uh, C-suite training programs here in Google Cloud, and we've been the take-up of those has been immense in the past six months. Uh, we're finding that is really progressing well now. Uh, this initiative is much more about a kind of grassroots, uh, you know, next generation of skills uh, as people are either coming into the workforce or looking to transfer from their existing roles. So we see a lot of people you know, early in their career looking to reskill. Uh, these programs are really, 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 really useful for that. Um, the example I've got in my head is one where, you know, imagine, Caroline, you're just exiting the services. You're 25 years old. You don't quite Not know what be. you're going to do. <laughs> you know, you could, uh, yeah, if only, hey, you could... Um, yeah, you, know, you could take these programs. You could work, move into cybersecurity, and these are really, really good jobs. The average, the median salary of a cybersecurity role in the U.S. is one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars. You know, they are the sorts of the sorts of roles that are you know game-changing for families and 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 their ecosystem. Lee, I get your grassroots explanation, but public sector cloud is such a competitive marketplace for you guys, right? AWS and Azure also putting a lot of emphasis on public sector spend. Does kind of literally grassroots training help you grow some market share there? Jensen Wang talks all the time about sovereign AI, but I'm yet to see any evidence that you know, government departments know they've got to get the checkbook out. Well, I think what we're seeing is demand across the commercial sector, the public sector, and from individuals uh, for skills. And you know, when I'm recruiting, you know, I'm looking for people who have energy and passion and Googliness, but I'm also looking that they have the fundamental skills in AI or data or cybersecurity, whichever the role is. So um, these programs are really geared for the individual. And then obviously every organization needs to determine what skills they need in their, in their group. More energy, more passion. Lee Moore, Global <laughs> Cl Google Cloud Consulting Vice President. Appreciate the time and the conversation. Thank you. And the president uh, was uh, was very direct that uh, this was a, a huge success, uh, that, uh, that Israel can be proud that it doesn't stand alone and that it has superior military capability. Iran utterly failed in what they were trying to achieve uh, and that that success alone sends a strong message to Iran and to the region uh, about Israel's place there. That was U.S. National Security Council communications advisor John Kirby speaking earlier on Bloomberg Television. And we're waiting for more remarks from the White House as President Biden holds a bilateral meeting with Iraq's prime minister. Joining us from Washington, Bloomberg's Balance of Power host, Joe Matthew. And Joe, I mean, the, the messaging from the administration to Israel has been take the win. What else are we hearing? That's right. Take the win. And if you do decide to do something, particularly if you want to overreach and attack Iran directly, the U.S. may not be there to support you. Having seen the U.S. provide concerted support over the weekend, it was quite remarkable. And this does require perspective and on both sides of things. John Kirby is right. This was an extraordinary success. I'm not sure that all the parties involved even knew it was capable to block 99 percent of the hardware that was thrown up in the air by Iran the other night. Not a single UAV managed to infiltrate Israel of the 30 Iranian cruise missiles launched. None of them broke into their airspace. But look, it also requires some perspective on the other side as well. The people of Israel now know that Iran is willing to attack Israel directly, and they do believe in many quarters that that justifies a response. Certainly Benjamin Netanyahu is hearing that from the right. Uh, domestically here, the question is whether the White House can keep Benjamin Netanyahu and his government restrained in whatever response it does pursue.
Joe Matthew, we thank you so much. Really important ability to break down the story and push it forward for us. Meanwhile, look, we're going to turn our focus to what's actually currently underway in New York because Donald Trump has arrived at the courthouse this morning where his first criminal trial is underway, which is expected to last six to eight weeks. Let's get the latest on the ground with Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines, and it is another first for Trump. Yeah, this is the first time in U.S. history a former president has been under criminal trial. These proceedings, of course, begin today. He's charged with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records related to alleged hush money payments made to porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty. He denies all of these allegations. And he right now is sitting upstairs in the 15th uh, story uh, courtroom at the defense table as there is a number of motions that they are dealing with. And actually, the judge has denied several motions already, including a motion for recusal and also the defense's attempts to block entering certain things related to Trump's alleged extramarital affairs into evidence. The judge has ruled that the jury will be able to hear a lot of that evidence. That said, the jury is not assembled yet. Once they get through all of these motions, that is when jury selection will begin, and they'll try to find 12 jurors and six alternates who can be Im uh, impartial, unbiased in assessing this case which, of course, relates not just to a former president, but the current presumptive Republican presidential nominee. So highly consequential what begins today, but this is a process that could last six to eight weeks. In total, it could take about two months for this trial to reach a conclusion. Haley Lines outside the courthouse in Manhattan, we thank you. And what's so interesting, Ed, is almost as a proxy for that betting on Trump potentially being the nominee and indeed future president again in the United States, has been his own social media company, which you're able to, of course, yes. buy shares and exposure to. But that social media startup, Trump Media, has been down a lot today. Yeah, part of that, uh, I think, is partly due to an offering and some market mechanics. But I was listening to the radio and Bloomberg Radio surveillance on the way in, and it's like... A proxy. I think you're right that, that whatever happens in that trial, and Kaylee will be on the ground for us, you, you kind of infer your thinking about President Trump from it um, in this race. Yeah. Parent of Truth Social, which is Trump Media and Technology Group, filed to register shares, we understand, so which, of course, are including those linked to warrants. That's why we're getting a supply-side pressure coming on the share price. But notably, it has been down about, what, 60% from its highs after it did did de-SPAC and has been publicly trading as Trump Media and Technology Group. Meanwhile, though, I've got to go back to some key technology stories. And you're the person behind one of the main ones, Tesla, just bringing us, as you raced in this morning, the ability to report on what's happening yeah. with executives leaving. Yeah. It's hard to know if the, the downward pressure on the stock is the 10% layoffs. Actually, I'm hearing it's much deeper than 10%. Or Drew Baglino and Rowan Battelle leaving. Think about the intellectual capital that's left. Zach Kirkcon last uh, August. The chips leadership that left earlier this year. Musk has taken an X to talk about it, Caro. You know, the, it's interesting. Why did they time it this way, the executives, mm. if it wasn't linked to the layoffs? I don't have the answer for that. And this next phase of growth that everyone keeps harnessing, the idea that we are in between these new Between two points. Yeah. yeah, but then are we, if we're likely to be pulling back from a cheaper model and more focusing on robo-taxis? But what I did here is that whatever the reasons for Baglino's departure, things were actually going very well in planning for that next stage of growth. I heard 4680, for example, is really ramping nicely. So, it, again, people's reasons are their own, but, but clearly the market and our readers are paying attention this morning. There's also, of course, the ongoing EV context that is not a pretty picture right now. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Boy, it was a big one. Yeah, so much to recap on the podcast. Uh, you know where to find it. We're publishing to Apple, Spotify, and iHeart, of course. The pod is also on the Bloomberg platforms. Uh, day one of what is going to be a big week from New York City and San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology.